Ready, Mark? The quick answer of how I was brought into the band was through a recommendation of a very dear friend of mine, Jim Gregory, who was playing bass for the band. The reality is that it didn't happen that quickly because they were looking for someone to fill the spot and I was the last on the list, inevitably the only one who could cover Bruce's chops at the keyboard. Bruce was the seminal center of a whole conceptual idea, but wanted to free himself from the keyboard and thus needed somebody to do that entire seminal idea behind him. And with my classical background, I was it. There was a barbershop, uh, proprietor to Steve Nee. Ironically, my father had performed with his father, who was a vocalist, this small world. And Greg Diamond and Jim Gregory, uh, drums and bass respectively, uh, happened to have been in a band, Five Dollar Shoes. It was a big push, the album, the whole thing, but the album didn't make it. So they were ready and hungry, and they had their hair done there. Steve befriended them and showed them the first album. That's the one with the half man, half statue. And they, of course, looking at opportunity, and everybody on the street knew about money was going into this, what is this thing? And there's the big poster on Broadway. Uh, if anyone in, in recent day remembers the Pam Anderson po uh, poster, which was like 40 by 80, it was the same size, but it was a different location. And all the buses had Joe Bryas, uh, portrait of the album, which was a double album photograph on the side of it. I mean, it was Joe Bryant, Joe Bryant, Joe Bryant. So they went after it, they auditioned, they got the job. Now, mind you, they w did not play on the album. The album material had already been recorded, but they needed to put the band together for the Midnight Special. So time is rolling, time is rolling, and the target date for the Midnight Special, I don't recall the day, was January, early January, I think second week in January. And the days are going by, and they have no one to fill Joe Bryath's spot. Now, you have to understand, Joe Bryath, we'll get into this, I'm, ass I'm assuming, in the interview, was an extremely complex human being. As an artist, he was a, quite a visionary within his proclivity. He had an amazing total ball of wax from visual to audio to lyrical perception of what he wanted to do. He happened to have been a very gifted a classical pianist, and from stories I had heard, had even been paraded before Eugene Ormandy of the Philadelphia Orchestra as this wunderkind, and Ormandy took notice of him. Obviously, he wasn't a Eugenie Kissin, so he didn't become this classical entity. But within his entity of evolving through theater, he became Wolf on the West Coast production of Hair. He was a very pretty boy, blonde locks, and he was this charming, ebullient, fathomless talent who's just cranking out all these tunes and all these art designs and to make a long story short here's this phenomena so Jim and 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 Greg audition and now we're getting 10 days before the midnight special and the biggest problem was that here is the the vortex of this whole ism but he wants to get away from the piano other than maybe some solo moments on stage but to front this so who is going to become him? And there was nobody in rock and roll who could handle the gig. Me. Had you heard the music before you got hired? As a matter of fact, I had. Um, Jim and I were very close. We were in so many bands together. We were even driving cabs as bohemians to make our rent in between and all of this, and we always shared music. And at one point, he said, I want you to hear this. 
And he went into the bathroom and the music was on and I'm listening and I'm listening and I'm just being further drawn in and drawn in. First, certain things were kind of spiky and, and this and that, but then all of a sudden there was this, this classical ribbon of depth that just washed through and I went like Yakubian and heartbeat and I was saying, who is this? This is awesome. Little did I know I'd be playing in the band maybe two, three months later. Who hired you? Who was the one who said, yes, Hayden is going well, to Well, Bruce, of course. Uh, it, 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 that's kind of a funny uh, f remembrance for me. Um, here I am with hair down here. Well, you see, my hair's back again. But of course, for the tour, it was this long and day glow orange. Um, I come in wearing leather and go in with my Clavin at D6 and an amplifier and crawl down to go down to Lambertville. I drive down to Lambertville and go into the door. I'm, I'm met by Hargrove uh, and, and Obi. No, I'm sorry, it was Chuck and Obi. And um, I set up my equipment and Steve, Lo everyone's posing in their superstar manner. Jim, my best friend, wouldn't even acknowledge me. Maybe he was afraid that if I completely screwed up, his job was in jeopardy. So I understood that. And Steve gives me a contrite nod, Steve Love, on guitar. And he says, well, we're doing this, the changes of this, and I'm setting up and the changes of this and the changes, and he walks away. Thank God I've got good holes in my ears because that's all I was given. I set up and we're starting to play and we're doing Earthling. I started playing them as best I could and listening and learning the vocals and the changes and the release and the da da da. And then Bruce walked in and Bruce was listening and in a heartbeat he just sashayed up to me and said, you play Simply Divine like Gloria Swanson and then went off to peel off his clothes and show his ass and his dance belt and leotards, very t skin tight, basically translucent to transparent as opposed to opaque. And then went, grabbed the microphone, and yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, at that point, I just intuitively knew I had succeeded in my mission. And there was a Jim released a tremendous sigh of relaxation because obviously his ass could have been on the line for a misnomer, to say the least. And I succeeded. And then Jim came up to me and said, Yeah, congratulations, this is good. And, da, da, da. and then Greg came over, and, you know, like, and Steve was cool as ice. How do you explain that? It wasn't some of the more rigorous auditions I would subsequently have in the music business, but there it was, and I was in. And then the horror. Oh, by the way, I didn't say the key, key, key point here. There was only 10 days to the show, and Bruce was very specific not to say what tunes were going to be for the Midnight Special. So I had to learn the entire show in 10 days. Memorize it. That's all the music, all the vocal parts, lyrically speaking, my specific vocal harmony and all the insane changes of all the keyboards I had around me in 10 days. So you were hired to start with the Midnight Special with uh, January. a look ahead to go on tour? Well, there was, oh, Jim was always, this, 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 is, this could be really big, Jim. This could really be big. That's how he would talk to me. He was from Appalachia. Interesting story about Jim. At 12 years old, left home, landed up in the combat zone in Boston. A whore fell in, fell, fell in love with him, raised him like her, his mother, bought him a bass. He became a musician. I mean, this is... So here I am, coming out of a, a suburban, well-protected, though showbiz hip, very hip family, but very loved and nurtured. So I was a total virgin naive with Jim, who was only four years older than I, and yet he was like 25 years older than I. I used to call him Papa Jim. And his street sense were extraordinary. And though he wasn't a, a quote, literate musician, he had incredible skill of picking up quickly, which got me going. And we would go, and then we became junkies, we, uh, m music junkies, it just absorbing everything. He was incredibly eclectic. And uh, very dear soul, I, I miss his presence. He passed. He had a heart attack at 56. Wow. Yeah. What kind of a musician was uh, was Jobriath? Bruce. I knew him as Jobriath. I now euphemistically refer to him as Bruce. He was a real deal. A real deal. He could play piano. Had an excellent left hand. Certainly compared to the fodder of rock and roll, he was there, with the, with the few exceptions of, of those specific players who would be 
more in your face, whether uh, Rick Wakeman or an Emerson, Keith Emerson, um, that's within the rock package. Um, he could sit down and play a piano and, and would have the full length and breadth of what would be the underpinnings for an incredible resonating performance where you could visualize the whole orchestra and yet he was just playing piano. And yet the funny part, he was such an incongruity because his voice was such an obnoxious kind of singing voice, not like, uh, I'm sounding like a, a Jewish Borscht Belt comedian, but it, it, like that Mick Jagger thing that might grate on you the wrong way and yet then you come to the bloody lyrics. And he had a way of talking about l the lifestyle of his existence that was, was so self-effacing. All his critics didn't see his sense of humor. For instance, uh, Movie Queen, he says, I've always wanted a Movie Queen to call my very own. So here I am. So sorry I'm with you tonight. You know, I mean, come on. It's camp. And it's so overt camp. And yet, the whole industry went like that. And yet, you look at Yakubian, as I said. You look at Dietrich von Dyck. You look at the symphonic inter intermediary pieces, the intermezzos that he wrote for the Paris Opera Show. This boy knew his shit. And if anything, maybe he was caught between what one expected rock and roll to be. Yes, glam was starting to come out. Bowie was doing his extraterrestrial thing and his peekaboo androgyny. But Bruce came out, boom, I'm this. And it cost him his career. You asked me about the personnel. Well, it's kind of a cross between Alice in Wonderland and, and the Wizard of Oz. Oh. Maybe my dog doesn't agree with that, but Nonetheless, the other, other members of the troupe you have, uh, you have Chuck and Obi and, and Hargrove, uh, were, were three gay men of different animated bent. Uh, Charles McNeil Chuck was a transvestite, though I never saw him in drag. His nose was badly broken because unfortunately he ran into a bunch of Neanderthals who were taken aback by his appearance and hit him in the face with a two by four and, and he ran after the street ran down the street chasing them, you bastards and bleeding all over the place and uh, never had the money to fix his nose. And uh, it was a fantasy that, that we'd make enough money that he could repair his appearance. He, he would <laughs> The boys will be boys and their witticisms and nicknames that he, he was called Quimba. And he would lay on his stomach with his knees stretched out, stretching himself wider and wider for obvious entry of a tractor trailer. I mean, he was so spread out. And he was, quimba, quimba, and this would be going on. He, then, of course, now we have, this is the platinum fellow, the platinum hair. Then you had uh, Marlo B. West, Marlo B. West, O.B. O.B. became his nickname. He had the most <gasps> magnificent, purple hair you have ever seen in your life. It, it was like fur. And apparently how he achieved that was to bone it out, bleach blonde, and then took a magic marker in the mirror, hair by hair. Oh, Olivia, you want to be on camera? I know. And hair by hair by hair. And until it was just translucent, magnificent purple. Then you had, oh, well, let me explain. Marlo. Marlo, if Chuck was a queen, and I say this lovingly, with all the nomenclature that's out there, from the entire litany of saying, well, I'll save that word for Hargrove, Marlo was a fag. It didn't impede his humanity. He was one of the nicest human beings you'd ever know. He was one of my dearest friends during the tour, where everyone else was, even Jim, who was a close friend of mine, there was this posing, constant, constant posing and aloofness. I was completely a virgin, totally naive to all the street-acquired 
knowledge of survival and thus cattiness. So I somewhat became, uh, and I'm not crying the blues, I'm just looking at this clinically, the whipping boy, because I had the strongest core. I was solid, I was loved, I knew my identity, I was there, and <laughs> I was square. Even though my hair was down to here and I could play my ass off and sing and do all the things needed to propel this tour and make everybody successful. Obi had an incredible sense of humor, and he used to refer to people very cattily as assholes. But he wouldn't say assholes, he'd say assholes. So all of a sudden we'd be somewhere in tour, and there'd literally be a thousand, an ocean of heads, and I'd hear, ah! <laughs> <Whoa. laughs> you know, the dog just went off. <laughs> and I would just like sonar, would just drift, and there he was, and he'd go, <laughs> and, there would be, and there would be Obi. So tell me a little bit about Greg Diamond. Allow me to talk about Greg after a couple of, because there's, there, there's a build, it sounds, okay, no excuse problem. me, but there's a funny build up to okay, this. No problem, sorry. Um, Jim, wiry, 6'1", uh, dark blonde hair, he weighed 141 pounds. He was a rail. And he had extended lower ribs. That, in fact, how he broke the ice with our friendship. When I, I had heard him in a recording session, I had introduced myself, and he was bowing his bass. And I remembered Jimmy Page bowing his guitar, and I thought, this is very cool. And he was doing outrageous stuff. And, said, and he was very eager to meet, and he would talk like, yeah, hi, 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 hi. And, 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 and we became friends, he came over, he was talking, talking, and then all of a sudden he's in the bathroom, he says, hey, Hayden, you wanna see something fucked up? And I go, what? And he comes out, look at this. And he pulls his shirt up, and here are two bumps. And I went, far out, extended ribs. And like he went back in the bathroom, and like they just broke the ice, and it was cool. And from that day on, we were like this, shared music. We might as well have been lovers. We spent 12, 15 hours a day together. Music, music, music. Drive a cab in the day to pay our rent. Music, music, music. And we were working our way up the ladder. Steve Love was in the band Stories. Louis, 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 Louis. Okay. Toured, the world, toured Europe, obviously had experience. He happened to be one of the players on the album. A critic. Um, contritely acknowledges me. Gives me the changes to what they're playing, Earthlink. Earthlink. And uh, interestingly enough, the amount of warmth that he showed me that first day is basically the warmth he showed me all through the tour. He was very reserved that way. Almost to the point that anyone who would show any kind of engaging warmth was square. Greg Diamond. Greg lived, breathed, and drank the role of rock and roll icon superstar. He looked like one, blue-black hair. He really was a, a dark blonde, uh, but blue-black hair, chiseled, very effeminate. In fact, I would be subsequently shocked by what he would wear during the rehearsals to make me wonder, are you a closet bisexual, Greg? You know. I didn't care, but he was a good player, but he was posing. T tremendous arrogance, and it was, in fact, he who was instrumental in creating the slag for me bringing in the, into the band. Uh, both Jim and Greg were in a band, Five Dollar Shoes. A very impressive art design album. Big push to come, but the album was, I was very diplomatic. I didn't like the album, and apparently the people didn't like it either, so it died. You have Steve Love coming out of stories that had the hit, but it uh, didn't happen. I'm playing with everybody. In other words, we were a bunch of serious wannabes, and this represented something quite serious. Big money compared to then. I mean, the comparison I my God today would be probably a million dollars in preceded money. All the buses, the out two albums, and da-da-da. One hadn't been released yet. 
uh, which explains why my name is on the sleeve with Jim and, and, and Greg as one of the creatures of the street, which was a correct thing to do, but it was nice that they, they could have pushed this aside, but it was put in, and that's why there's the inclusion in the insert of the album jacket. We had, which was kind of mind-boggling to look at these other gentlemen uh, in the troop. I remind you, I'm totally naive. So I mentioned Chuck, I've mentioned Obi, Waller West. Hargrove, in his tweed suit and uh, brunette hair, like a college professor, vest, California homosexual by definition. Unfortunately, Hargrove had the proclivity of listening into other people's phones conversations. That was very interesting. He roomed with Steve Love. Steve was very reticent, never smacked of anything other than what he was as a heterosexual. But it's very interesting in subsequent years to hear the reticent conversation and, and denials, not so much as an overt denial, but not the unwillingness to talk about as if there was a secret. Now, I'm not casting aspersions or innuendo or anything. Steve's a marvelous musician. And um, I, I, I'm just looking at this as, as I saw it. Dot, dot, dot. Um, Greg, very interesting about Greg. Let me say something analogous to Carl Sagan in the universe. With the billions and billions and billions of universes out there, if there isn't other life, it seems a terrible waste. Well, if Greg wasn't at least a bisexual, let alone a homosexual, it seems a terrible waste because he seemed to live the being effortlessly almost aggressively, flauntingly, to shock, because he loved to shock. He was very, I wouldn't say self-destructive, though he ultimately proved that, because he died of a heart attack at 52, obviously from cocaine abuse. He used to snort coke until his nose bled. But he was a wild man, in typical rock and roll fashion. Uh, for instance, having a date and them speeding along the highways of Los Angeles, and we know about the boys in L.A., how seriously they take their profession. And Greg sees this sign speeding and decides to stop the car, back it into the sign. This is why the highway is going. Knock the sign over, take the sign, and put it in the back of the rented station wagon and bring it back to the motel. How do I find out about this? The next day, before we're doing the midnight special, I hear, hey, Scott! And I'm going like, and I hear this woman's voice giggling in the back. And, I, and finally, I'm drawn in, and I find the place, and here they are in bed. And here's the sign speeding. I said, Jesus Christ, Greg, you did this in L.A.? Anyway, this was Greg. This typifies and what happened within the tour, and we bailed his ass out. I'll tell other stories about that. But Greg was that kind of thing. Though I never saw Greg consummate anything other than a heterosexual contact, he pushed the envelope all the time. If he was a good actor and he was into the shock level, he nailed the job. He, he lived the part. Um, there's another member of who I don't consider part of the band. Um, we had 10 days, as I said before, I had 10 days to catch up. So here we are at the point of relaxation and uh, Obi one night, we're, we're starting to relax, and Bruce is starting to go, yeah, this is sounding good, and the band was good. Now let me tell you something about bands. You have serious aspirations, certain things give you goosebumps, you go, and you're playing, ooh, 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 and then there's seminal moments where you go like, ooh, wow. This stuff started happening almost immediately. For a band, I, 10 days old? For us to play as we played, you can't diss that. There was definitely something there. I don't care with all the BS and all the negative and the positive hype, throw it all out as faith or hype. Disingenuous. The reality is the bottom line. When we played and as we toured, things would happen in rehearsal where we'd look at each other and these things would just come into place to the point that we became lethal. We really did. 
And the irony is this, basically when everyone had fallen away from us, they, they wrote us off, we were abandoned by Electra, we were abandoned by Jerry, and then the things of magic started happening. Where gigs were called back, we were asked to go back to the boarding house. Things like this, and then of course the, the astounding Tuscaloosa concert. So I made the audition. That was it, Bruce grabs the microphone, we're rolling. Great, we're all relaxed, we're feeling each other out, looking, talking, and here. Next day, oh, and Bruce quickly leaves, and I'm left with the guys, and the guys come and congratulate me. Next day, Bruce comes back, and we're, we're gonna talk terms. And I'm sitting at the t coffee table. All the other guys are up in the house, in their rooms. And uh, Jim and Greg room together, Steve Love and Hargrove room together, Obi had his own room, Chuck had his own room. I was stuck somewhere up in the attic. And I'm now sitting at the coffee table and Bruce comes in and I'm looking at all these drawings and they're by Bruce of set designs, costume designs. And I'm, and I'm going through and I'm not a neophyte. My parents were showbiz people and I'm going, damn, look at this stuff. I'm being very cool. And Bruce comes in and I said, uh, well, you're off the street, you got a place to sleep, and you have, you have good food. I don't live on the street. I appreciate the offer of the food, but I do have to pay my rent. Well, you're going to have to talk to Jerry. And he gets up and leaves. <laughs> sitting there, did I just fuck this up? Oh, God. Schmuck, you talk too much. Oh, my God. So I'm talking to Jim, and Jim goes, yeah, I know, man. You know, he says, but we're going to do the Midnight Special. We're talking about a national tour. The albums are coming out. I mean, what else are you doing, man? Shut the fuck up. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So I called Jerry on the phone. And like Jerry's like, well, I'm paying this amount of money and maybe down on the, on the back end you, you'll get some more money and there's, there's hundreds of thousands of dollars and then I'm going But I acquiesced. Okay. You asked about the characters of people. We're playing better. Sitting, becoming a family. Out of nowhere, Obi says, hey, let's go to the prelude. I remember hanging out with a bunch of queens and the band and the stress. I figured, yeah, okay, we'll go out, go to a bar. I'll lift a few with the rednecks here just to change scenery. <laughs> go into this place called the Prelude. Little did I know it was the inland pines or the cherry grove of, of, of New Jersey, right across from New Hope, Pennsylvania. And it was Mardi Gras night. And everybody was decked out. And Jim was wearing his purple lame jacket and his orange sunglasses and saddles up to the bar and I'm in my leather, looking like a leather queen. As a result of Troop Riot, I stopped wearing leather for four years. <laughs> I had a complete closet of leather. I couldn't wear leather anymore. I'm going like, oh my God, that's not me. You know, but go in and here's, here's uh, Obi walking around in his purple negligee and a fright Afro purple wig, pinching different boys behinds in different directions and going, eh to me just to catch my attention so we would make eye contact and he would just be laughing and just having fun and then saddle up to the bar and Jim goes I feel like we've just landed and they're doing impressions in the other room and they're at least a second two seconds behind in sync and nobody cared and the jukebox was smoking I mean smoking and at a certain point it was just like screw this let's dance and we were all dancing which was the first seminal realization about sexuality. Who cares? Let's have fun. Lesson one. That was very important for me. The, uh, the tour, that ends, we come back, we come back to the house and everybody's cool and like, it we're becoming now, it's like, more homogeneous, family, hi Aiden, da da da. And Jabriath comes out of nowhere and he says, Hayden, what are we going to do about your hair? My hair was done here. What about my hair? Well, look at us. We're the future. You're living in the past. I'm thinking, excuse me? Look, I have a friend who cuts hair. 
tomorrow we're going to cut your hair. And I'm going, oh, fuck. Do I walk from the gig? Do I blow the gig? Here I am in the kitchen. The whole band sets up. It's arena. It's like gladiatorial events. Bruce sits his ass up on the, on the counter. Girl comes in. She's about to cut my hair, and I scream, Stop! Give me a piece of paper. I want to save my hair. So Hargrove puts a newspaper on my lap. And the next thing I know, I feel the back of my hair grabbed like this. And it says it goes, And I'm thinking, that ain't right. And all of a sudden I start feeling like a razor cut and I turn around and see she has linen shears in her hands. And I grab her wrist and I look at Bruce like, you son of a bitch. And then Bruce just got up and left and everybody was there looking at me, looking at them. And then they slowly started to disappear and Obi was left. And Obi looked at me like, like he was gonna cry. And I walked into the bathroom to see my new modern look. And I had just been castrated viscerally. I'm looking at myself going, oh my God. So badly cut, it was above the hairline. It was a disaster. So that was my first experience with Bruce's humanity, or lack of. 27 years later, I have a completely different overview because of life experience. I'm a family man. I've seen life, I've been all over the world. I've done concerts all over the world. I'm an international, I've seen everything. I can speak about him differently and psychologically understand where this came from. But in a sense exercise as an actor, talking about me, Hayden Wayne, this virginal presence who's saving his ass, being the only person who can play his show, to be treated like this so sadistically, it's enough to take a ball-peen hammer and blow his head in. Which, be that as it may, it was very painful for me. But there I was. Now, so the whole house disappears. I go upstairs, wrap up my hair. It was pathetic. Put my hair in my, in my, in my effects. And I went back downstairs and started rehearsing my part of the show. As I had been every day playing, and as people would wake up, they would come, and because I, I had to work, I had to really learn the timings and the knob changes. I mean, one thing, I had 17, this is old technology, 17 different knob changes, plus having to sing to make the next cue, and find myself chasing everybody to the point I became so facile, I was waiting for the band thinking something was wrong. I mean, but these are the things that you intuitively do and you don't even think about it, and you're going like this, and you're going, and you're singing, and you're looking, and you're being showbiz, and you're putting on a show, and you're this. This is, you learn this. None of these things that you see on stage are ever an accident. Don't let anybody BS you. Michael was the most, Jackson was the most rehearsed person out there. And look how he got himself into such a dementia of changing his image just so what he would look like on stage. That was his true home. That's where he looked like a million dollars. He was a freak in real life, but he tried not to re live in real life. He was in Neverland constantly, be that as it may. So the band starts to come in. They're hearing me and like, okay, he's okay, he's okay. And then we would start to rehearse and play. I'm going through this long-winded explanation to show you something about even, it already started, the push-pull of everyday life, like siblings in a family. There's a dysfunction in every family. All this stuff is happening. Well, it's starting to really happen. All of a sudden, Billy Schwartz comes in. And it was like, ah, what, who, wait, wait. He comes in as one of the originals, he and Steve Love had played on the album. And now, all of a sudden, everything that we rehearsed, he would stop to make a correction, when Bruce never did. Bruce allowed it to grow. He saw it. He was comfortable with it. Things would happen. He, he would be bothered by my straightness, because I wasn't that backroom Max's Kansas City of the street, slick or posing. Jim Gregory, remember I told you a story, Jim? left home at 12. I mean, he, he was 60 years old, even though he was only in his 20s. I mean, life experiences, and it obviously aged him and haggard him. He ultimately died at 56. Too premature. Lovely man. Greg, posing, posing, posing. Self-abusive, cocaine, to the point his nose would bleed. Died of a heart attack, 52. Anyway, 
Here's Billy Schwartz with his sil naturally silver hair. The band was a trip with all its colors. Um, and he starts interrupting and we're doing things and he, he, he was like this, this pain in the ass. And we were rooming together, we were sent upstairs. And I do not want to be documented dissing anybody. So I will stop my forward conversation about this. But the one thing I will say is, the smiles and the, the niceties projected by him, I have never met anybody more disingenuous in my life. I have a funny anecdote. We're sitting in Lambertville, and one day we go in the kitchen, and I grind up some ice and some orange juice and make a slush. I said, yeah, everybody, come on. And then, oh, this is great, and then and Harvey, well, how did you make it? Well, I, well, you take some orange juice and you grind up the ice, and, and then Jabrath piped in. You see, Hayden, that's your problem. If you ask me, I would say, I breathed on it. <gasps> and that's Bruce. And that's the posing. Now, to be specific, how he treated other people, I know I'm not in chronological order. I'm having a very deep sense flashback at the moment. We're sitting up at Max's Kansas City in a booth. About eight of us squeezed in with Bruce. His music's playing on the jukebox. It's a dark blue ambience. And we're abuzz because things are about to unleash, so we think. And somehow, sensorily, and then finally, I found myself studying him. He was troubled. He wasn't there. He wasn't excited. There was almost like a foreboding. I'll never forget that. There was something, it was like him looking. And never forgot that, then he got up and left. I did ultimately began to witness and subsequently, years later, put the pieces together. Um, okay, so we're going to leave the next day to get on a plane to do the midnight special. I don't have to bring any equipment other than my, my mini Moog and clavinet because the organ will be rented by um, <clears throat> by the show, and um, I go home to prepare. I'm going to leave my car with my parents' house in Great Neck. That was then. They're not there now. They're dead. Um, <laughs> my mother opens the door, and she looks at me, and she goes, Oh, my. <laughs> And you have to appreciate, my mother was an Earl Carroll vanity girl through the portals. Through these portals walked the most beautiful women of the world. I mean, mom could stop a clock. She'd suck the air out of a room. She would, women would bristle and men would just go. She was, and she was as brilliant as she was beautiful. And she looks at me and I said, oh, mom. And I'm like, oh, I'm home. Oh, shit, man. He says, well, why don't you dye your hair? You know... I mean, I wanted to get my, I was thinking about that, maybe blue. I mean, Todd's got green, I don't want to go green. He said, well, how about orange? I said, orange? He said, yeah. If I make a mistake, it could be orange. Really? I'll get the chemicals, go take a shower. So, showbiz, <laughs> she goes out to get the chemicals. I go take a shower, come back, sit in the kitchen. She bones out my hair, first step, and then goes to dye my hair red, but make the classic mistake. My hair was so orange, <laughs> it was like a brand new penny, orange. <laughs> so here I am, oh, and I had gone to see this hairstylist to work, and I says, my God, who cuts your hair? It's above the hair, and he tried to do damage control and layer, something, I was just, so it kind of looked punk and off the top and this and that. Coming to Kennedy Airport, I get out, my mom drops me off, and I walk through, and I hear, hey, scarecrow! What a ball! And of course, it was Greg Diamond, and Obi just comes out of nowhere. Zoom! That's fabulous! So turn around, that's great! And he starts looking at my hair, and the whole place just like stops because we have purple hair, 
gold hair, orange hair, silver hair, light blonde, frosted, henna. Steve Love was henna. A rainbow, and people are like, what the hell is this? This is before we get onto the plane. Now, since in my mind, my workings of my mind, I'm going chronologically, I have to cite something about sexuality. This is 2000, we're almost 2010, 2011, 2012, and on as we view this documentary. For you to appreciate 1974, listen well. The heterosexuals had no clue, really, about their sexuality. Though they would never even experience a homosexual fantasy, let alone a physicalized experience consummated. They truly didn't allow themselves to be at rest. So they were always flexing, literally, figuratively, metaphorically. The big machismo guys lifting weights. These were these obviously latent characters. So for them to view anyone who would flamboyantly come out and announce himself as the true fairy of rock and roll, and that's a direct quote, It's such a seminal experience. It's like Jeanne d'Arc. I know Quentin Crisp, may he rest in peace, lovely man who had all the iconology of being this revered, self-outing individual who was a real wonderfully funny, charming man. But Bruce stuck his head in the mouth of the wolf and said, I'm the true fairy of rock and roll. And you could hear glass break everywhere. Now. That's the heterosexual camp I'm talking about. Let's talk about the homosexual camp. What I didn't know until I subsequently would hear people talk about this in interviews and become so stunned, and that's when this became catalytic, that the, that the pieces started to fall together, was to let the fellow re remain nameless, but one of the cognoscenti of the back rooms of the scene we resented Joe Bryath being the poster child, embodying attributes that we so loathed in ourselves. And I went, holy shit, Bruce was a dead man walking. Now, I'm gonna say something that's gonna sound very sexist, but believe me, it's not. There's all kinds of jealousy, and it has nothing to do with sexual proclivity. But in the amplification of queendom, where everything is amplified, the affectations of speech, which are not necessary for you to fulfill your sexual proclivity. It's all th theater and showbiz and carrying on. Well, the vehement aspects amplify too. And I have never seen such horrific, catty, cutthroat, sadistic, disingenuous-like, just total loathing of one of their own who had the balls, excuse the pun, of outing himself to say, I'm having a good time, join me. And if you don't believe that last statement I made is true, just study his lyrics. They're all self-effacing funny with your three little feet on the ground from Earthling. So sorry I'm with you tonight. It goes on heartbeat in the, or, 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 or blow, blow away. Or, or, it's, it's endless. You start to peel back the lyrics. If you, peel the, if you put the lyrics in some kind of chronology, you almost see an anthropologic journey of someone's own self-explorations, even though obviously by his own demeanor was outed from, he knew he was gay from birth. He obviously did. There's no question about that. He was so totally at rest. That's why I was never offended by him. He was honest. I was in awe of his talent. I resented him as a human being then. I will get to what turned me around at the end, but Bruce is heroic in my book. He is the Quentin Quisp. And people should really have open forums. And when people, young people talk, they're confused about sexuality and am I dirty and am I this, and this could even be within a heterosexual camp. The unknowing of sexuality, which is the greatest gift we have given to mankind, the ability to free or freely express ourselves by, with people we admire and like to be with, short of abuse, because that's another twist of overindulgences, which lead to so many deaths. I mean, I, as a heterosexual, if I did the same numbers today, I'd be dead. 
I mean, it, we were the human petri dishes, but those who, who got into, uh, I don't mean to be scientifically crass, but the over, overindulgence of, of drug abuse, which would lower their immunity, this is a theory of mine, plus fecal consumption, and plus the, the, the abrasions that would happen from anal sex, allowed themselves this cross-pollinization that created this monster. I also happen to be an optimist. It's one of the best things that ever happened to mankind, as cruel as it is in the moment, that because when we finally find a cure for the immunity deficient disease, we will cure all diseases. So it has put us on fast track, and now that they sussed out the genome, we're very close. I think in 10 years we will have done it, and we will go into the renaissance, which we should do. But be that as it may, this cruelty that, that Bruce was affected, and here I am, this naive puppy, going, why did he do that? Why, why did he react this way? Why did he react that way? Which I'll spin out later. I understand now. He was a dead man walking. You want to talk about courage? Give Bruce a purple heart. And I mean that. I'm right now time tripping. I'm going through sense memory and witnessing what was affronted this fellow and the courage to go out there with all the detractors coming in to kill us, and they couldn't kill us, but a snide critique would happen from, I'm sorry guys, the gay camp. The heterosexuals were, let's not talk about it, let's, he, let, let them go away. There, there was because they felt that if they talked too much about it, someone would accuse them of being closeted. So they were damned if they did, they damned if they didn't, but the gays were already out. And I'm sitting here going, now let me out myself so I can even the playing field here that I'm not blowing this out of my ass. Being surrounded by so much sexuality constantly. And let me tell you, in that house, everything was invited in. You had Leather Queens, you had Dairy Queens, you had Steve McQueens, you, you know. You had the whole nine yards. You had leather guys who were so into, who were so masculine they needed a man for a woman. Thus my <laughs> getting rid of my own leather retire, I'm going like, but I like women. No, but, but I, I, because everything became a uniform. It was extraordinary and it was exhilarating and it was frightening, it was new identities. All this stuff was happening. All of a sudden, I, you know, I, I, I start thinking about sexuality. And I'm going like, and the inevitable, well, I could suck a cock, I'd probably give great head, because I know what I like. And I go, oh my God. <laughs> What will my parents think? What will my friends think? What will I think? And going through obviously what every gay fellow went through or anybody through sexual exploration, here I am now going through my own thing and thinking like, what the hell? And then I go home and fuck everything in sight to prove my, and this would go on back and forth until finally one day, I inevitably woke up and started to laugh at myself and said, hey schmuck, who knows? Even the person you just had sex with, they won't know, only you know. And I'm sitting there going, oh, what a moron. And at that point was my second seminal experience. And two things happened from that. Not only did I completely chill and became a master of, in a clinical context of a, becoming a professional voyeur, which was instrumentally important to my, to my work that subsequently poured out of me, but observing people and seeing how at rest they were or not. And the other thing is, being at such rest, how then subsequently I was accused of leading people on. As if saying, get the fuck out of my face, faggot. I don't give a shit who you sleep with. Just come to work with a smile on your face. You're getting laid, you're chilled, you're a good human being. I don't care how you sexually express yourself. It's the least important and the most important privately. But so what? And this is me. So I'm jumping all over the map. Remember we're talking about the color of the hair, hey, scarecrow at the airport? I run into this fellow. I was doing commercials for Ogilvy and Mather, and here's this Scottish fellow, and his nickname obviously became Scotty, and that's how I knew him. And he would go out of his way to stop and talk with me. Fabulous fellow, have a lot of fun. Here I am now, and I see him in the airport, and I run up to him and go, hey, Scotty. He wanted to climb under a chair. He was like so self-conscious, he sees me. And I, and I, I sense this, oh, we're doing the midnight special, I just did this, this pisser mom just did this, and then, and then. He wanted to hide and run away from me. I'm telling you, this was a heterosexual. He couldn't stand the insecurity. 
These were lessons. I was a learning, and I'm a firm believer that all this sexual, sexual fragmentation of securities are the causal effect of everything that we experience in life, other than greed specifically, but war too. Machismo, this and that. And watching all this, I'm from the school that 15% of cognitive sexual awareness is fixed, whether you're a heterosexual or a homosexual. The interior 85% folds on a fulcrum of asexuality. And you have mirrors of it, whether you're a gay or you're heterosexual. Yitka, my wife and I, have a friend who's a doctor who's a homosexual, never slept with a woman in his life, and I'm telling you, this man is a closet heterosexual. You go like, so what I ultimately observed was those going up and down the street like day-glow lawn furniture in their various decolletage, accusing everybody else of being phobic, were in fact the most phobic themselves. And this is the group, excuse me for being long-winded, but I have to do this, this, this plaintive explanation because this is the group, the world in which we traveled and explored. So audiences were able to go to a point, but they couldn't go any further? Oh, there's no question about it because they were so naive about their own sexual proclivity. But let me just quickly jump ahead and we'll come back. After, and there's so much fodder to put in between, so this is a real jump ahead, but when we finally did do the tour and we were in the Manassau Coliseum, I'm in the green room, waiting, 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 because I, I don't want to spoil that other story because I'll repeat and I'll come back. But the point is, we were booed off the stage as being faggots, pelted with hamburgers and all this crap. We, were we went on so late because of the tennis tournament that preceded us, and this was a benefit conf concert with Rufus, with Shaka Khan, and we opened up the bill. And this, this it was so bloody iron ironic, is we were two and a half hours slagged because of the over, they, they were going into over, such overtime with the tennis that by the time we finally went on, a lot of the jock crowd was still there and it was a mess and they were infuriated by seeing us and we were booed off the stage and then ultimately shepherded off the stage so we wouldn't receive physical injury, which we were that close from getting. We were already being pelted. Well, Billie Jean King was in the height of her lesbian, self-professed lesbian relationship of seven years when this happened to us. These were her fans who booed us off as homosexual. Need I say more? 1974, a magic year. So when Joan d'Arc, through the convenience of the corporate monolith of the Roman Catholic Church, which had its specific business agenda, was dealing with Joan, who professed to hear spiritual voices guiding her, she was a major threat to the status quo. But we're talking about sexuality. You, this is not, like, who the hell am I to talk long-winded about the, the observations of the, You can say whatever you want about me, fine, knock yourselves out. But this is what I saw. I was discovering myself sexually, though I never crossed certain lines, though I would fantasize, but as we all know, fantasy is fantasy, then there's reality. And I say to the public out there, be true to yourself. Don't let anybody take your dreams away from you because by God, they're gonna try. Stay true to yourself and love yourself. Excuse me for being that personal, but human beings are human beings and we have to take back the earth. The first time I met Jerry Brandt was on the phone. <sighs> Brusque, in your face, producerio, no, I'm God. I didn't say that. I'm paying this amount of money. You're this. This is going to open up your whole career. Da 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 da. Maybe later, but this is it. Take it or leave it. How do you respond to that? Good acting. I would subsequently, in progressions, get to see the animal who was acting as much as Bruce was acting. Jerry did come down to the house to hear a few run throughs. He was pleased, charismatic in, in his manner. Um, once again, I find myself in a position of talking about somebody I don't really wish to. Um, Jerry and I have subsequently become friends because I understand him as well. But Jerry had a really infamous reputation. Oh, first time I saw him. This sensory fl flayback. Now yeah, I know how you memorize scripts. 
electric circus. I was in the Salvation Navy. And Jerry had walked across the floor out of his office. That's the first time I had seen him. Small orbs, right? Didn't introduce ourselves. The band was good enough to be playing at the uh, electric circus, but that's my first time of seeing him from a distance. First time more intimately, but still just as equally a distance, was at Lambertville in the house he came to hear us. Croft such like Mick Jagger. All rock and roll image. As a manager, even if he was competing with you, you should only have a manager like Jerry. Jerry did come up with the money. Jerry did tout his on the level with Elvis and the Beatles property. But there was something almost like Jagger and, and Richards, the Glimmer Twins that we lovingly uh, affixed that title to, that is applicable to Bruce and Jerry. Jerry's the manager, Bruce is the talent, the entity is Joe Bryath, but to hear Jerry tell it, and maybe rightfully so, I'm Joe Bryath, because he created it. But he created such a monster, who could live up to this? Especially a band that was only together for a matter of weeks, because we're talking about record, the recordings and the hype and all the nonsense, and, and the legends of the, the outfits being prepared and with Ray Deffen and all of this for two years before, so. And you have all the back, sexual backbiting. Elton John didn't out himself. Bolin's hadn't out of himself. Bowie hadn't out of himself. The list goes on and on and on. And here is Bruce, almost immediately, the true fairy of rock and roll in headline. Whew. Man. I remember Obi in conversation, in tears, having sense memory. Why did he say it? Why did he say it? It shows you as a damnation to society as a whole. It shouldn't have made a difference. But that only reinforces again my conversation about the times of 1974. I want to tell you why he cared about Joe Bryant. No matter, think about this, just from a standpoint of logic, no matter how egocentrically egomaniacally, megalomaniac you are. I cause you, I have the talent, you're just, you do everything I say, I'm Sven Gali, I'm Diaghilev. You still want shit to be seen in public? No. I never heard Jerry say anything negative other than super hype about Bruce and his talent and what they were trying to do. And in retrospect, as over the top as it was for the time, it was all true. It was different, it was intelligent, it had sense of humor, it has longevity. It's still applicable today. His music is still applicable today. You can't say that about everybody. When you look at an entity, let's call it the product, mm -hmm. and the product has created so many different eclectic levels for the size of the product. We're talking a singer, a singer who can support himself playing for himself, who happens to write the music, who happens to write the lyrics, who happened to conceive a whole identity for himself, and the costumes, and the art design, and the stage design, and what the show is supposed to be, and allowed himself, if he were phobic, to be outed, or maybe he just got so full of himself he didn't care and he said it and they picked up on it and really flamed the fires. Jerry came out of his track record. Did Jerry have the, f the facility to go into the behind, the behind the camera aspect, POV aspect, and manipulate the scenes financially and draw about power and do spin and spin and sin? Spin, certainly. I will say this, Jerry claimed, I haven't seen the papers, that he and Bruce signed a contract that whoever died first, the other owned 100% of. Doesn't surprise me. Doesn't seem so adroit, you know, so up, up, sorry, up, obtuse to reality, something to be a deal made with the devil. Who was the devil? Bruce was a horrific alcoholic. 
whose personality would change and become sadistic, I subsequently was able to see the differences. Um, I mean, my God, what was going through Bruce? And when we came back on the airplane from the midnight special, he had fallen asleep on the plane in such a way on his arm that his arm apparently, his left, no, his right hand had fallen asleep with the blower on, and he had the equivalent of Bell's palsy of his right hand. He was paralyzed in the right hand. It didn't come back for months. This is why I know he had a brilliant left hand, because he would be playing with his left hand. It was destroying him emotionally. And one time I had made a compliment to him about, he said, man, your left hand. And he, he had that one moment of human towards me, and he appreciated that a little intercourse, and then he reverted back into his image. Jerry ripped me off on the tour. I had a real hair up my ass for him. All the games, he, he, I, I did things in, 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 in trying to help the band that he then subsequently refused to pay, and I had put my name on it, and he, and he cut ties for me, and I was really incensed, and a gal that I had fallen in love with who was his secretary, and then he found out and he fired her. Elaine Boisseau, known as Inky, had later confessed to me, he says he does that with everybody. So he was constantly playing, you don't know me, don't get too close, I have an image, I'm dancing as fast as I can. Well, you can put that down, but I understand it and I respect the game. The game for the game, he played it as best he could. And obviously Bruce did too. But Bruce had more of a, uh, in my opinion, as a conceptualist and a creator, uh, I have to assume he had a greater vested interest because it was his work. It's his experience, it's his. Every time, you know, you hear this euphemistic, giving birth, one of my children, and they're all my children. Well, that's better than that. Well, I can't, that's still my child. You hear different people talking about it. Well, it's true. These are our forms of expression, and even if we may be embarrassed by how, how overly simple or naive or just putridly bad amateur one of our forms of expression were in our life or is, we have these other things and they're seminal because they, they balance the learning curve to getting us to the next step. We would have never gotten to this next step without this preceding step. So saying that, I have to sincerely, more than just assume, just really believe that this was personal. These were Bruce's pieces. Now remember when I said to you how sadistic Bruce was? When we were on tour and there would be that intimate moment where Bruce would perform solo, Inevitably, he would come and say, be, sing, be still. I would, because of the stage setup and all my keyboards set around, I was forced to be stage left and the rest of the band stage right. And the way the piano was, Bruce was facing stage left at me. And every single time he sang that song, he looked me in the eyes and sang, be still, I love you. There was this resonance of humanity in his work. When he sang, he sang. But I witnessed incredible cruelty. We were, we were in the Troubadour. We had, ironically, had followed Chick Corea with Stan Clark, Lenny White, and Al DiMiola, an album that Jim and I were just in love with, and we would share. And here we are now at the Troubadour watching these amazing musicians, and we're following them. And it's just, like I said, the world's a very small place. But Bruce is going to change into one of his leather outfits to do uh, World Without End, which was a, a Sat S and M tune, and. It wasn't on the schedule. What kept the band so fresh was we kept changing our song list constantly, even on stage. And he had to break down the door. Obi wasn't anywhere to be found, and he had to change. And you can imagine somebody sweaty trying to get into leather, and they finally got to on, and we're vamping and vamping. And the audience now knows beyond how many choruses of solo something is wrong. And Bruce finally came out, and he performed, and he did the tune, and it ended, and that was it. Well, he fired Obi just fired him, and we didn't know what happened until later the next day, and he was one of the troops. We adored Obi, but this was this kind of sadistic explosion that would erupt out of Bruce, but if you think of when in the tour, the tour is abandoned now. Well, Jerry was still there, so it wasn't quite seemingly abandoned, uh, but this was all falling on Bruce's shoulders, so getting back to Jerry, Bruce, the devil, the, the, this deal that whoever died first, the other owned 100% of, I have not seen a paper contrary to it, and I haven't seen a paper true to it. I refuse to accept that Jerry did anything of malice of forethought to tear Bruce down. Absolutely not. It's not in the cards because, as I said before, if Jerry had his own self-gratification involved, it would be contrary to reality. 
And Bruce was self-destructive, so he became this wild cannon. If he got drunk, his personality would change to the point of being, he would get so stoned on the tour that you would see him in blur as high as we would be. I mean, I know it sounds funny, but it's sadly true. For me, it's quite understandable why Jerry Brandt presents as everywhere to the point of what seems to be such egocentricity, because that's all Jerry had. It was so much Joe Bryath, and without Jerry, there wouldn't have been a Joe Bryath. Yes, there would have been a Bruce Wayne Campbell writing all these songs, a very creative chap. Maybe he would have, like Mickey Rooney and, 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 and Judy Garland, put up some kind of cabaret thing or something like that. Would he have necessarily been signed to a record contract, especially someone who was so overtly outing himself with such ease and effortlessness? I doubt it seriously. Um, it may have happened, but nonetheless, I don't believe it. I, I, Jerry was claiming his own when he introduced Peggy Nestor, presents Peggy Nestor. She was one of the financial backers. I did meet her in, in a bungalow out in, uh, the, the, in, in Beverly Hills Hotel um, while when the evening after we had filmed the Midnight Special, which we haven't talked about. But staying specific this before we run out of, out, out of film cartridge, um, it's a very interesting deal with the devil. You know, and I even mean that, mean that in the lightest sense, euphemistically, the, it's what's going to serve us. You know what you're getting into. You know you're signing half your life away or you're potentially signing all your life away, but this is going to get me across the finish line. I, I'm a firm believer that people, whether they're good, bad, or indifferent, hang themselves by their own pathology. Jerry never demonstrated anything negative towards Bruce within the context of a very self-interested pathology. He would, at first, what do you remember? I don't remember. What do you mean? You know, and trying to like, I don't remember. Ha <laughs> ha, I don't remember. Yeah, right. And then slowly, when he felt he could trust the waters, he started opening himself up like a, a willing virgin. I never witnessed Jerry doing anything negative. I did witness Jerry being very assertive and in the acknowledgement of what he created for the vehicle. Bruce, on the other hand, just sheerly demonstrated his talent by all the evidence of his talent around him, not as a human being, but as an exploitable product that he was presenting. Now, in response to what you, you had mentioned to me, uh, that Jerry had said that Bruce was really the mastermind and he facilitated the financial re wherewithal to get it done, you know, the chicken or the egg, the cart before the horse, when you, when you get, when you, as a creator, when you get that excited and you start showing something to such a willing reciprocant of your gifts, you do get excited and you can have the bravura and the, and the sensational acting moment of demonstrating the whole theatrical bent of the evening. And then, of course, those who have a more sounder financial reality go, what is this going to cost me? Well, we have to cut that. We have to shave that. Maybe we should bring him in. Maybe we can do this. And you can see all these Machiavellian gears one would assume would be going into place. But to th competitively, maybe at a certain point after the show is done, and for instance, after the midnight special, there's a surprise party for Jerry, and here's this whole spread, there's a whole bunch of people around and all of this. And out of nowhere, Bruce picks up the chocolate case and cake and smashes it in Jerry's face. And I was like, holy shit, what the fuck did he do that for, I'm thinking. And Jerry with absolute aplomb and laughing is toweling out the chocolate icing from his hair and off his $2,000 then jacket, thank you very much, and laughing, ha, 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 ha. But you know, he was seething. Now, at what point did did Bruce start resenting the fact that he was a dead man walking? I didn't sense it then. It was at that moment in, the, in Max's Kansas City when I looked at him and he really seemed to be otherworld? Or was it first to demonstrate when we were on tour? And yet the, the natural burnout of tour where you really start becoming the symbiotic unit, this real singular entity, not different components of humanity. One, Joe Bryath, where we would inevitably be hanging out with each other. 
and eating with each other or partying in the rooms and things were going on. It was a whole different thing. And there were those moments where Bruce would let go and seemed we were having a tour and we were performing and there were the afterlifes. And, and especially in San Francisco where you had this extraterrestrial wannabe mystique of... of, 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 of of beyond closeted sexuality, but the experimental ebullience of innocence and what is this? Oh, I'm an extraterrestrial and I dress like this and I do this. We had these followings and the people I would hang out with, they were wonderful, charming, innocent people. These were innocent times. And it wasn't until later in conversation with Jerry that Jerry would divulge the, the significance of Bruce's alcoholism where he would really psychologically morph into this very troubled individual who would be self-destructive. And that's something I'm seeding with you now because there is that aspect that it becomes very troubling. How much did he ultimately then go, okay, let's scuttle the ship? Because when he subsequently ended the tour, and I walked, I, bl I blew out, and the erotic circus was nothing, it was just a front for mafia money and the battles of going on and performing and not being allowed, and I had just gotten out before that, and I was like really bruised. I didn't like how anybody was talking to me and all this crap, and I just said, screw this, I got my gear. To hear Jerry talk about this self-destructive aspect, you start to wonder, did Bruce all of a sudden go, ah, and want to disappear? Because when he subsequently came to house pianist at Covent Garden, everybody, who subsequently would recognize him and obviously ask for a request of music that, of his folio. Not everything was great for translation, just as a piano vocalist, but his piano stuff is brilliant. He said, I'm sorry, I don't know that person. And he became Cole Berlin. I always wanted to go, hey, Irving, <laughs> how you doing? <laughs> you know, but uh, how many names did he have? My God, he had... Bruce Salisbury, uh, Bruce Boone, uh, Joe Bryas Salisbury, Joe Bryas, Cole Berlin, and he died as Bryce Campbell. That's somebody who's trying to get away from something. The sad reality is I never met Bruce. I, my memoirs are the 10 months of my experience of the Joe Bryas experience. In fact, it was so, certain road men would call him Joe of a contraction of Joe Bryant, and he would bristle. It was very funny to watch this. But I never knew him other than those few sadistic moments at me and cavalier things that I really resented until I evolved and then got the balls and one day told off all of them in Memphis. I said, you can all go fuck yourselves. I don't like the way you're talking to me. You're treating me. And then Joe Bianchi came up and he, said, eh, he, was, the, he was the road manager. I said, I said, I said yes, some fucking roadie and you talk, I'm not a road, I'm a, and then he starts bristling and carrying on. I said, you can all go to hell. And I walked out. And then that evening, sitting down for dinner, and they saw me think, settle down, we played, and then they never treated me like that. It was just, it's like what I said before, it's a very strange psychological thing. It's, it's like, we need to lash out at somebody. We're not being paid, we were being ripped off. All this venting, all this, and I was the only one who represented, apparently, I, I might be totally egocentric about this and patting, my, patting myself on the back ridiculously, but I don't think so. I think I was the one who represented such a core and such strength that they knew I wouldn't break, and if I broke, the band would fall apart. Not that I was a center pin, but if anybody on a tour leaves, you're in trouble, who are you gonna replace? So I represented somebody who could be the whipping boy. And when I finally said, Ganug, it stopped. And it was quite fascinating. And then at that point, when we went to the West Coast, we'd be rehearsing just to get sound checks and things would happen and we just, all of a sudden we'd go, what was that? I'm getting sensory goosebumps now from that. And playing, like things would just go and the band would go boom. And the band would go boom to the point we were just screaming. All the little idiosyncrasies that were like not really well thought out or too quickly put together, all of a sudden had reason. The pacing, the space between notes, the space between songs, the space between changes, not having to go over and change so much. We're doing a more relaxed show now. We're doing a shirt show in tights. We're doing this, or we're doing a little bit more theatrical.
It was quite extraordinary. You remember the icon of the RKO with the beep, 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 beep? Well, Bruce was supposed to climb up that like King Kong, and it was supposed to ultimately turn into this phalanx and ejaculating, and he's supposed to shed his, his clothes. It, it was just this extraordinary, over-the-top, erotic, glam rock event. So why didn't it happen? Money. It's all money. There was no money. It ran out. We were supposed to dig this. Jerry got us a tour in Europe. We were to be, go on the plane, be shepherded basically to the green room to decompress pregame for the show, do the show, and be put back in limos to go back on a plane and move out. And we said, no. And I had never been to Europe then. I would have loved to have gone to Europe and ruminate in every city. But it was a slave tour, and we said no to it. Because it was a day here, a day in, out. You wouldn't have seen anything. You just went inside of airports. And we said, no. If we, as a corporate or partnership entity, had a significant part of the financial pie to make it worthwhile, where we would willingly turn ourselves inside out and work for nothing, knowing that there would be return for the possibility that we would develop an audience in Europe to do one of these slave dive bombs, you do it. Well, were we being paid $125 a week, $150 a week? It was bullshit. We were doing it because Jerry had us caught. He knew we came that close to breaking the hymen of unstoppable. No matter how much you fail, you keep succeeding. We had pushed that envelope. Steve Love certainly had with stories. Jim and Greg had with Fight All the Shoes, not as significantly as Steve had, because they did have a bona fide hit. I was playing with everybody. I was touring with everybody. Billy Joel, the Yardbirds with Jimmy Page, The Fifth Dimension, Richie Haven. I mean, it goes on and on and on. I was known completely in industry. It, 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 you know, you talk about frustrations as an individual. I remember when Deep Purple had their hit. Everybody came up to me and congratulated me for, for the organ solo. Of course, that was my style of playing. And I was so taken aback. It's not me. Oh, shit. You know, but, you know, you, you grin and bear it and you go to the next evolution. I was in the Salvation Navy then when I was, what, 19 years old. So you see these things. Um, but the Paris Opera House, what I visualize now through my evolved state of learning theater as I have is, is constructing... In movie speak, which is not the same as theater speak, there's a whole different thing in real time in theater, but in movie speak, to morph this incredible evocative score of what was going to be, this were the, the big sensational points of this biopic that ends. It's almost like Spinal Tap meets Hollywood Boulevard. But that was Joe Bryath. And that's the tragedy because inevitably, if we had been backed up enough to have some subsequent gigs to survive in the South, set up a residence in the South, which would have been cheaper as our crash central pad, that we would evolve from and tour and tour and tour, and then as money would come and a contingency fund would come in where we can then have our own private dwellings or whatever, and pull that, we would have slowly, inevitably morphed the way anybody of worth who needs the rehearsal time and the sheer time in, on point in front of an audience where you're never distracted, you're just doing your thing, it would have happened major. Those buses didn't happen for free. That billboard didn't happen for free. The, the building of the set didn't happen for free. Uh, 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 Marlowe absolutely is convinced that Bowie bought the set because he claims he saw the set without the other uh, configuration on it. We know that that was a leading design suit for all the floats for, for the parades and you know, Macy's. That's a big buck. So who is what? Was how much? I can't imagine them building the set without any money down in front. And then they stopped and sold it to somebody else to recoup. There was money. The orchestra stuff that was recorded took money. I heard 50000 here. I hear the story with David Geffen and signing away a release to get 50000 to pay for this. and all. Who knows what is true? I don't know. This is, you know, in a court of law, it's hearsay. But... Somebody got paid, and they did get paid. Money was floating to expedite certain things. I saw Louis Vuitton cases that Joe Bryant had that had to be four or $5,000 each, the real deals. Mm -hmm. I remember being, being sewn into my costume for the Midnight Special at Ray Deffens, all the entire troupe. That's money. What does that demonstrate to you? Say it's 80000 
Boy, Jerry spun a hell of a yarn, didn't he? And he spun it in such a way and danced so fast to raise even more money. And the great tragedy for Jerry was the fact that the albums didn't sell. Because if the albums sold, then everybody would have thrown money. He was hedging it, he was dancing and puffing it up. So here's a guy, obviously, who's not anti-Joe Briath, he's pro-vehicle and he's doing everything in his power and saying things to the point that it became inflammatory against him, so they really wanted to squash him like a bug. But it just goes to show you how positive he was in this. 80,000, I would tend to think, now we're talking, my gosh, we're talking, 30 years ago, because I'm 27 years ago, so 30 years ago with this whole thing, I would think the equivalent, because rumors have a half a million to a million, I, I, I would safely say uh, this is no proportionally, this is not proportionally any more shocking than Moby Grape 100,000 or Ultimate Spinach 100,000, which totally changed the scenario of the music business. Because remember, by that time, Credence had self-promoted its tour at the Garden, they made a hundred thousand dollars, and everybody went. Did you? They made a hundred thousand dollars, and they promoted it themselves. And all of a sudden, the business became the business. How can I explain this? You come into a gymnasium, you have a fancy title for the joint, and you walk into a gymnasium. What money was put into the erotic circus? I didn't see it. I remember sitting at a desk. I remember seeing in the Penthouse magazine about a circus issue. And I had created a circus in April of 72, my own circus, which I tongue-in-cheek now I take the entire anthology. I call it Cirque de la Lune. I mean, it's the tongue-in-cheek of Cirque du Soleil. But it has nothing to do with acrobatics. It's music, dance, and song. Be that as it may, obviously, I have a very warm place in my heart for circus. In fact, I opened a new theater for the Mark Taper Forum in 83 with my circus. Uh, so when I, when I saw that, magazine laying on Jerry's desk. Also, Jerry grabs it. And it, like you think if you were really hiding something, you would very stealthfully move it or put some papers on and get on and distract you. He was so overt about grabbing it and throwing it in the, in the drawer so nobody would see it. It obviously stuck in my mind. So when the erotic circus came about, it all connected and I started to laugh because this was so pathetic. There was nothing erotic whatsoever about the place. It was a big cavernous, space, which was obviously a commissary area for a hotel at a previous time where maybe they would have, you know, dances or something or rentals, but primarily this is what it was, nothing. Now, I, that I have to do a sidebar on that. You know, you, you talk about these other designers and Bruce didn't necessarily design things or did he design? I know certain costumes, I saw the picture, so I'm assuming he designed them. The jacket, that clear jacket for the second album, he didn't do. But th I'm going to the point I saw the arranger orchestrator was Royal Sloan, which we know was a toilet, like Elton John. Jerry claimed that Bruce did do the orchestrations and that was his tongue in cheek. I happen to know there was a serious admirer of, of, of Bruce who was writing diaries at that time when he was working uh, for Jerry and hated Jerry and, and admired Bruce and said that he learned how to orchestrate from books within a matter of weeks and wrote out these orchestrations. I pride myself on my orchestration. I killed myself to be as good as I am. Is it possible? Yes. Is it probable? In that short period of time, I don't know. There's nothing earth-shattering about the orchestrations being, as Nikolai Rips-Korsakov would say, orchestration is composition. But that being said, the functionality of them in the context of what he was trying to represent are impeccably perfect. So he did succeed. Is he Royal Sloan? Is there a Royal Sloan? This is part of this hocus pocus that Br the collaborators of Brant and Joe Bryath or Brant and Bruce or Brant and Campbell of the Joe Bryath ilk created. And we will never know. This will be things of folklore. But nonetheless, no one else is stepping up to the plate and saying, I wrote it. So we have to assume, granted a dangerous verb, he wrote it. The Paris Opera House debacle became self-evident when the tour ground down. We landed up in Tuscaloosa and there was nothing after that. So you went on tour because his 
his live debut was supposed to be the Paris Hopkins yes. show. Yes, and we landed up at the bottom line after a warm-up joint in the woods, and there is that photograph where outside, and that one photograph where I'm leaning on Bruce's back, and they're holding legs almost like Harpo Marx, that thing. That I remember that photograph, and it had disappeared, and I'm so thrilled that it was found, because that singularly is probably one of the most important photographs of the entity of the band because that was right after our, our preheat warm-up of, of Joint in the Woods. Then we did the bottom line, and then we did the Nassau Coliseum, where we were subsequently booed off the stage. Now, I had mentioned that story before. So we're down. Two things happen now. Nassau Coliseum. Billie Jean King is running late. They're going into overtime. Sets, they, these guys are, uh, you, know, you know, I'm not really a big tennis fan per se, but I can only assume that they were playing their asses off and they, were, they, they kept tiebreakers and they kept going because we were two hours and a half behind schedule. The place, not only it's so far behind schedule, the place should have been cleaned out, vacuumed of all inhabitants, and then we're set up to do the show, do a sound check and run. None of that happened. We were just thrown on stage. While we're in the green room, killing time, some of us slept, some of Steve was noodling on guitar, I see the script and I pick it up. It's nothing to do, I'm starting to read, I'm reading. The next thing I know, hour and a half later, not even that, I'm done and I just turned, I said, where did you get this? This is amazing. Oh, they want me to play in that. I said, this is incredible, you gotta say yes to this. It was dog day afternoon. And what Bruce confessed to me, no, I don't, want to, I don't want to wear a dress. Now, let me say something about Bruce and his sexuality. This is fascinating. And this just popped into my head. We're talking about him announcing himself as a true fairy of rock and roll. Yet, in the inevitable nakedness that we would all find ourselves in a dressing room, changing, Bruce was very demure. He'd always cover his genitals. He was very, not that he was like so introverted, but it was just like shyness, like boom. It wasn't, hey, look at me, da, 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 da. And we're primarily walking around like that, all in the room. Chain, give me that, give me that, and laughing and slapping each other. Oh, stop, and uh, oh, fix your hair, butter boom, put this makeup on for me. Could you fix that, please, that, boom. And they were getting dressed and running out the door. It was like, or the groupies would be in and helping us. But the groupies wouldn't be with Jabriath. I mean, that would be something else. But when we were, as a family entity, in pregame, there that was. We do the show, I explain, get off the stage, you faggots, boo. The sound, I've got sensory hearing. That sound, that beast is still in my head, the booing. And the pelting, Coca-Cola, and a hamburger splat, and this and that. And we're rushed off the stage. Jabriath is sitting downstairs now, in front of these, my God, there must have been eight by eight mirrors. And he looks at himself. And he starts to heave, and he picks up his Louis Vuitton makeup kit, and he smashes it into the mirror. Now, Greg Ory was there. Greg Ory got indicted. Jerry got indicted. Greg, as you know, landed up in prison. Jerry was found clean. But Greg was one of the guys that he was getting money, manipulating monies out of. Greg goes to start to attack Bruce. And we all run in between with Joe Bianca and, like, separate. This guy was going to kill him because I think he already sensed the loss and all this other stuff. Somehow, Bruce was like ushered out alone, and we change, and, this, and we're now we're going out through the bowels, coming up to the limousines. And here's Bruce with these bigger than Bob Dylan, Gloria Swanson sunglasses, and you could see tears just pouring down his face. He was so completely humiliated by this, leaning against the limousine, and... Uh, I remember seeing that, and I went up to him, and I said, I'm not going anyplace. I'm with you all the way. And then I went back into my limousine. And as we were driving, I wrote this poem, Starman Lullaby, which I just set to music as the lights were going by. That, ooh. Cruelty. I don't like cruelty. 
Oh, well, look from that. That was brutal. That was brutal. And then we subsequently did the tour. The South was very warm to us. It was funny. You know, it's, it, there was this, we were a band. We, we would, the West Coast was better. It was more theater. You know, when you talk about L.A. and you talk about San Francisco, you already have a, <laughs> an animated personnel and personality that, that would find, and also, you got to be real, the size of the city would create a significant percentage that would equate itself numerically would be a large number head count in any specific venue, even though proportionally it might represent a fraction of a fraction of a fraction of a percentage of the population who might ultimately have had hated him or had been so terrified by what he was emblematic of. You know, it, it, it's, it's quite fascinating. But this was what ultimately started, I think, the final countdown of the devolution of where the overt self-destruction started and the smoking of rocket fuel, which is elephant tranquilizer, and, 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 um, and the heavy drinking. We were, it's very funny, you know, <laughs> you talk about funny sideboys. Yolant, Bruce refused to go Holiday Inn, so we were going first class as, as if we were any supergroup. And cable television was a new entity, and here were these movies. But you would think, we would assume that there would be a different movie in every city. No, it was the same movie. So it was Blazing Saddles the entire time. So we had memorized, we'd keep it on all the time as background noise, and we memorized the entire, the entire script of Blazing Saddles. And why we'd be going down an elevator, we would do a scene in, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our garb for the show, which was, means height and drag, you know, and, and, the, and the locals would be looking at us like, what the hell? And, you know, and here I am, the virginal, virginal, not knowing what the hell I was, fellow, getting to the point of having my clothes custom made in LA, see through chiffon, getting to wear G strings. And the, like, I didn't give a shit. I was getting laid constantly. The most gorgeous women were coming out. The most gorgeous boys were coming out for those who were into that. People came because it was just celebratory outing, whatever that means. It wasn't dirty. It was Mardi Gras. It was celebratory. And the audacity is when Bruce was saying, I'm so bad, I got you glad, and every glance you threw, ooh la, you know, and like, so bad, ooh la la. I'm flashing back now. Stan Harris, Midnight Special. We have to present the material. Take me, I'm yours. Diffuse me, abuse me, I'm yours. I'm your fantasy. And Stan Harris is looking at us just like out of the producers of Mel Brooks. Mel Brooks followed us. He's, he's the subtext of the tour. Anyway, that, that frozen look of the audience, like looking at a springtime for Hitler. And this is Stan Harris looking at us. Says, you can't do that on television. We had just finished I'm a Man. And it was kind of like a quiet reticence there, but this Take Me, I'm Yours just freaked out Stan Harris completely. And Jerry starts to do a song and dance. And Bruce wisely goes into Rock of Ages to give the second tune. And what Jerry told me was that he was having a sexual liaison with the assistant to Stan Harris. And we're sandwiching Stan Harris trying to convince him. And then finally I said to Stan, I said, Stan, if you don't put him on, the gay mafia is gonna come out and kill you. And he acquiesced. Now that's what Jerry said and he laughed. Now whether that's true or not, I don't know, but we landed up and we didn't do Take Me, I'm Yours. Now, you wanna talk about funny? This is funny to me. The tour's over, the whole nine years, the bitterness of this and that. I'm in my apartment, I'm in the kitchen fixing something and I hear, Take Me, I'm Yours. And I go, <laughs> and I run out of the kitchen into the bedroom, and here's the TV. Take me, I'm yours, TWA. <laughs> and I start to scream in hysteria. I mean, right? Who to thunk it? <laughs> you're, you're on a shooting schedule. You have how many minutes you want to put on your log. You know you have a rough guesstimate of your script design. You hope for serendipity. That's a natural. And then whatever... You know, disasters will happen along the way. You have to write in at least a percentage of time to that. You know this. Well, there was so much time to do certain segments, and we were this segment here. We filled in a slot when Stan would be there to see the audition. The shepherd is then out on the stage to do our thing, and boom, 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 here we are. And that's what happened. Well, when we did the bottom line, I had um, my parents come. 
It was sold out with expectation. We did two shows. We were, we were asked to do an encore for both shows. The applause were very serious. I had invited uh, two friends of mine, Lorna Luft and Kenzie, um, Mackenzie Phillips, who sat with my parents for it, and they thoroughly enjoyed it. Look, when you're expecting all this hype and this razzle-dazzle, all of a sudden you get a basic pencil sketch at the bottom line, and I know Alan you know, and Stan, who, who owned it, the, the nice guys, and in fact they wanted to manage me at one point. So it was a, an incestuous family, but it was nonetheless a pencil line, so people were insulted. As it were, because well, you promise us this and you give us this. But then came that horrible debacle at Nassau, and then we went up to Boston, the performance, and the humiliation continues. The opening act was this guy called Sweet Pie. We we're loading in, we're sitting there waiting to do our sound check, and here's this guy standing naked with a thong with two amber beads like balls. A leather thong. And I'm, and I'm like, what is this? Didn't know who he was. He's like, oh, you want to get this asshole out of here so we can set up? You know, like, we didn't think some guy got freak off the street. It turned out to be our opening act. And he had some kind of half ass comedy act, but he sweat so much that everything was soaking wet. I mean, as if somebody poured a, a gallon of water all over the piano and the floor and the piano bench. So Bruce was appalled. He said, I'm not sitting or playing that because literally the piano would be dripping water. Because at that time, I was playing piano too, and then we would switch it, move it, and then Jerry came and said, no, it's taking too much time. And I was upset because I lost my instrument to Bruce, all power to him, but I, the decision was right, but egocentrically, I was hurt. I, you took my instrument away from me, you know, because I was playing all the other keyboards. So that was that. Then from there, we went down to Atlanta, and we played a club called Richard's. And I never forget walking up, and here's a security guard. And I swear to God, his arms are like this with his jacket holding Saturday night specials. And I said to the guy, I guess we've had to play pretty well tonight, huh? He said, yeah. And so that, but the audience, that was a week, and they liked us. Performance center was a week. These were like tune-ups in the process, on point. Come back up, now we go to Chicago, two days. Ed Begley Jr. opens up presenting himself as a comedian, though I think his performance demonstrated that he was the only one who understood the joke. There were maybe 15 people in the audience in total for the two days, but several things started to happen. First, I stopped sleeping. So I was up for 48 hours, and or, or, already that tour thing started to happen to me, where we started to go, and you start going to alpha state. Also, it was Monday and Tuesday night, which those in the business know always revere as the hip nights because night off and you're playing for your peers. So the few that were there, it was just a few of the locals. It wasn't the kind of the theatrical following as opposed to just the locals on a night who would just want to go out and divert themselves while they're drinking. So that doesn't really count, but we were playing. Then we go into Memphis. Memphis was the godfather. And they had the horse's head and the car that Sonny was assassinated in while people ate around us. <laughs> but that, that was the place. And um, once again, well, I left, out a, I, I left out a place, son of a gun. Before that, it was the Bijou in Philadelphia where the stage was so tiny and the place was packed. And it was fascinating because you could only fit the drum kit and the organ and the amplifiers. Nobody else could fit on stage. So like the, we're doing balancing acts ready to fall into the audience. And the mezzanine was such as that your head was here and the mezzanine was here. So it was that intimate. Now, it's fascinating how some of the reviews were catty. The audience adored us. And, what, and that's when we started looking at it. It started to click. And then, by, then we did Atlanta. Then we do Memphis. Then Greg runs Four Lights looking like he did. And I'm thinking about what he did with the stop, with that speeding sign in LA. And I'm going, this moron here. And they were going to hang his ass, probably throw him in jail with some degenerate and sodomize him and shave him and the whole thing. And he was freaking out. He was terrified. And, 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 and Joe Bianchi came up and told him, and he was relishing the story laughing. He said, so what are you going to do about it? Chewing gum with his mouth open. And I, and I just shook my head. And I, and I just reached in my pocket. And I took out a $100 bill. And I said, tell him to fucking grow up, man. And I walked out. Steve put in 100, and a group of other guys, because we didn't have any money. He put in 50 and bought off somebody with $250, and he was 
slapped down. He was persona non gratis in Memphis. We were persona non gratis in Memphis. We were shepherded to play the gig, play the gig, go to the hotel, and get the F out of town. So that was a seminal moment in bonding. All of a sudden, people stepped up to the plate and it demonstrated something. Now we're off to L.A. Mm -hmm. Doug Weston's troubadour, ironically following Chick Corea, who Jim and I adored. And that's when it started to happen, when these flashes would happen in rehearsal and the band started to really come and the L.A. crowd and Jerry shows up all of a sudden doing his L.A. thing. And... Um, once again, what is real? What is fantasy? Who has got an ax to grind? Were we that good? Were we that bad? I'm being very fair here. I'm being very nondescript. Well, it's for those who witnessed it. But in the meantime, we kept going. You know, we had, we had done the boarding house in San Francisco and drove down to do Doug Weston's place and then were asked to go back to the boarding house. Why would we be brought back if we didn't demonstrate financial reward for the proprietor? Forget good or bad. It's financial reward. Obviously, the places were packed, and we were generating good news for the owner. And that's what happened. And then finally, from San Francisco, where Joe Bryant ultimately was just seven sheets to the wind, we got on a plane paralleling a thunderstorm for 750 miles in first class while the rest of coach were white knuckling it having a pillow fight. I swear to God. We just know that Jerry stopped paying us. And we sort of started to sign our name to everything. And thank God the proprietors knew better than to accept our signatures because we would have reamed them. We were doing first-class hotels, signing our name to everything affiliated with the hotel. We were even trying to buy cameras and buy things and buy signing our name to the hotel bill because we had no compensation. We were fed very well, drank very well. And the serious uh, wannabes who wanted to hang out with us, well, we were serviced sexually very well. I had beautiful women on the tour, and drugs were floating. In fact, that when I told you that one funny anecdote about Joe Bryant looked like he was in a blur, when we had finished that one night, when we were leaving, we were at the boarding house, but we were at Barcadero Square at the Hyatt Regency, beautiful hotel at that time, brand new and with a big reflecting pond and those outside elevators, and of course, Blazing Saddle playing religiously on the channel, and we're doing our Blazing Saddle renditions. There was a party. And everybody was smoking dope, and and I wasn't really a I was never a heavy user, but I someone said angel dust, and I thought that was just good grass. I didn't know what angel dust was, so I took an Indian hit, one big hit, not knowing that it was elephant tranquilizer. And the next thing I know, I just slid down the wall, and I hear Joe Bryant going, "Hey, look at hey," and I'm seeing tracers going by. And I got violently ill, and I'm trying to crawl back out the door to get out the door to get back to my room, which, interestingly enough, is room 1706, where Mel Brooks shot high anxiety. I mean, Mel was all over this tour. It should be called the Mel Brooks Jabriya tour. <laughs> and um, all I know is I was vomiting for the rest of the evening, and Jim drove, the road manager and I was in the back seat sick as a dog and swore I'd never do that again, driving down US-1, while the rest of the band in another car smoked rocket fuel the entire way down. Now, I can only assume they took a straight line to L.A., but... And this was... Jabrath. Negative reactions. I saw, say, from what would be a voyeur or an audience, was obviously the Nassau Coliseum. But then specifically, that friend of mine, Scotty, reacting to me homophobically. When he, knew, he didn't know, he did, thought I was, but he was obviously a heterosexual, and he couldn't handle it. Other than that, it never really entered. That said, mm -hmm. we were specifically warned and not booked in Cleveland, Cincinnati, and Detroit for fear of our lives, that they would come to the hotels and do a serious physical harm. That was the absolute belief. Another thing about the tour, to show you how shotgun it was and how Jerry was desperately trying to book it, you, 
you really make money in bus and truck tours, which are obnoxious, but at least you're consistently flowing and you don't spend that much money. Air travel, freight, and all that's exorbitant. And you were playing ping pong across the United States because that's how the gigs came in. So by the time we left San Francisco to go all the way across the country to Tuscaloosa, Alabama, that was the last gig. We had been dropped. Jerry had basically burned his bridges. L.A. was there in between San Francisco, but what's ever going on between he and Joe Bryath, what other people are saying to humiliate Jerry's image. Such as? Whatever, but enough to drop us. He said, I had it. I gave up. I said, screw it. He says, Bruce was too self-destructive. Couldn't perform. Couldn't show up for a gig. Couldn't show up for this. Couldn't show up for that. But he was showing up for a gig. Well, I know, but this is what Jerry was saying for other things that he was trying to set up in place, whatever they may be, if it's true or not. We do know that Bruce was self-destructive. I witnessed it. We went into Herb Alberts in, um, in L.A., and we recorded there. We also recorded in San Francisco. We had recorded one song in New York before we ultimately embarked on the tour, uh, Weightless Love, which we did present as an encore to the bottom line. Now, I know the tracks in San Francisco were lost because bills weren't paid, so they, and then they ultimately evaporated. Steve Love has the two inches. Um, I know that they did, they did a remix of a Good Fight, Oh Lord, I'm Bored, Horrible mix he did because I have a I happen to have a a a, um, a pirate that Jim had given me that is just sounds like it's underwater but you hear how predominant the voices are and it's the voices that that, that I didn't even play keyboard on it it was a guitar track it was just like a a, a a a a a real punchy guitar trio but it was the voices and the pugnaciousness of of Bruce singing like give me your best shot. MF, come on, oh Lord, I'm bored, you know, hit me, abuse me, diffuse me, bang. We know the business and how many people don't get paid under what aegis, if it's chapter 11 or just your dirt bag. <laughs> Things don't change, so I can't answer that. But I do know that there are certain tracks and other tracks are gone. Uh, you know, there was a New York, New York, and Girl of the Night, and gone. And who paid for these? Who authorized them? <laughs> We were on automatic pilot. We went where we were limoed. We played where we were limoed. We didn't pay for anything because we weren't paid. Whatever pocket money I had to buy my own clothes or had people custom make things for me was my judicious ability to handle money the way my parents had taught me to make a dollar last a week and still have a dollar at the end and have somebody make me something. But we were not... You know, we were ripped off. And then when it came to the end of the final negotiation, Jerry blamed me for bending the bonnet of his Porsche, trying to voluntarily help him lower it. <laughs> I was a little high that night, and I bent it when he squeaked out, no! And I bent the front of his Coco Porsche, and uh, he never forgot, <laughs> forgave me for that. In fact, he blamed me for bending that, so he didn't pay me the $2,000 he owed me. And I said, you owe me one. Well, the one he owed me is subsequently we became partners in publishing. We're going down in an elevator, and Bruce is beyond, beyond seven sheets and abusive as hell. And he starts saying, well, I could get anybody I want. And I said, no, 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 And I just went, really? Do it. I look at Steve Love. I'm done. Bye. Elevator door open. We went out. Steve, like all the blood ran to his feet from what I heard from other guys, he said, Hayden, just quit. So I said, I'll do the gig tonight, but I'm done. So we go in, and I'm belligerent. It, like it finally hits you, you know, the use, the abuse. We started to play doing the show and doing the show. They freaked out. It just kept going. Encores, encores, encores. And we started have, having to repeat material. They wouldn't let us go. Screaming, screaming. We're in the wing, screaming. We'd come out, ha, 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 boom, 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 boom. The place somehow catches on fire. I don't know where. Somewhere in the air-conditioned vents. And, the pl and it starts filling up with smoke. And Bruce says, this is not one of my effects. 
And here's, I, I look at Greg, who could kiss my ass, because he, he, he slept with one of my groupies. I mean, I mean, no one's loyal to anybody, but you're so misguided and you're so burnt out of the tour, I felt betrayed after I had bailed him out of a Memphis prison, and I was pissed off at him, and, you know, and he just starts, starts playing a backbeat or something, and I just start riffing on the organ, and we just start going into another thing, and the place erupts, and firemen come in, and the, they start standing on the arms of their chairs, and they're screaming and screaming, and the fire department ushers us off and everybody out. You want to talk about a great ending of a show? That was amazing. Well, it's done. Now, the end of the show, and we're looking at you like, do you believe that shit? Like forgetting the emotions, the immediacy of the hatred and all of this and the exhaustion. And it's like, do you believe that? I said, man. And then Steve said, Hayden, look, if I can book us, will you stay? And I just went, for you guys, yes, I will. So he got on the horn and he broke his ass, that, that poor puppy, all day into the night trying to get bookings for the band off of this. Exp and it was like, it went out like wildfire. And there is a tape of it somewhere. And he finally came up to me and says, go home. Now, we were supposed to stay for a week. I just took my own money and I just went home. They came home a week later and then did the erotic circus, which they ultimately didn't do. And I got my equipment and I left and that was the end of it. If we had a little bit of seed money just to keep us there safe, benignly, for a month, that would have been luxurious. Two weeks, I'm telling you, we would have gotten another gig and created a following and it would have happened. No question. Boom. Well, it wasn't for us to do. We were employees mm -hmm. and treated like such. Sorry, guys. You know, I mean, that's why when you, like, I was so angered by all the sense memory of cruelty that Bruce had put on to me and then not being paid and all the stuff adding up to a big hill of exploitive bullshit. In fact, being more hurtful to my career. Uh, other than the fact when word got out that I hit the streets in New York, I got all the gay work. Mm -hmm. And helping all the serious wannabes and the singers and this and that and blah, blah, blah. But, the, but unfortunately, as phobic as people are, regard, it has nothing to do with proclivity, phobia. But as soon as they found out that I wasn't their proclivia, I started losing work. I can only know what I assume if it were, in fact, a 10-year agreement and this much sweat and tears and humiliation went into it. Why would you even talk about negotiating and letting go? You also have to remember Jerry gave Carly back her music. Car Jerry could be very well vested today, very benignly and rightfully so as being her manager, holding on to her music, music, and he was just a human being then, and he chose never to do that again. What is really ultimately in your heart and soul when you're laying in your own sweat in bed alone at night i.e. my own discoveries about my own reality, about my own sexuality. You know, you know, it's very funny, going back to sexuality. You know, fantasies, you can fantasize. But the bottom line is, are you going to swallow the smell? If you can't cross the smell barrier, you ain't going to cross the line. And that's literally, figuratively, and metaphorically. And in this particular case, it was probably, I can only assume it was best to let the plane crash and burn and stealthily get away as best they can. Be real. Bruce changed his name to Cole Berlin and never acknowledged Joe Bryath or played the music of Joe Bryath. So if he, the man, the creator, is in denial and stealth, how could you not forgive Jerry for the same thing as manager? And Jerry didn't really survive that. I mean, I, I ran into Jerry years later. As a matter of fact, I had just met my wife. So we're talking 88. Uh, it was around the, 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 the early spring of 88 where he had a club called Spodiotes. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was invited down by, uh, by Jim because he was in a new band called Lou Guru and there was a Zydeco band and he wanted my opinion of it. And, and as I said, Jim was my friend, so I came. And it was very funny to see Jerry see me, and Jerry acknowledged me, you know, very politely. But the place looked like a, somebody's basement in Brooklyn with two big gorillas ready to bust heads sitting on a couch. It was obviously mafia front money. In hindsight, 
just, I mean, if you could go back in time and knowing how insanely phobic both the heterosexual and specifically the homosexual camp was, because I blame the, the gay camp for destroying Bruce, not the heterosexual camp. Heterosexual camp, as I said before, was more indifferent. They won't acknowledge him. But there were certainly enough gays to support several Joe Bryas in the industry who would be part of them without being tainted as this piranha, which he was. So that's, that's the, the, the single most significant thing. But in hindsight, I would say to this to anyone who has a band, you make sure that you have a contingency fund to be able to perpetuate what you do in lieu of what critics say, because staying power is everything. So as long as you can keep going and keep going and keep the overhead down, low exoskeleton, just keep going by the sheer devotion of your portion of the pie to keep it going. And, uh, and if there's anything of worth there, it will happen, period. Think about the reality. The tour was only two and a half months. That's nothing in a timeline of any entity. So if that tour represented nothing more than a preheat and we were allowed to come home and lick our wounds and reform, have additional new music and talk about the show, let's go out again and go out and find and say, you know, we did really well in the South because it was proven in Atlanta and it was certainly proven in Tuscaloosa. If we book our Southern Conference and we go there and we find a place to live in and do this and we have X amount of dollars to do that, that's how it should have been done, but it wasn't. Jerry already had torn the, the cloth. He was dealing with the erotic circus, I think primarily as a payback for who knows what kind of capital, because obviously no money went into it and the place closed as soon as it opened, but how much money for the IRS was dumped into this spectacular new opening, which was non-existent. I heard about Bruce's passing from Rob Cochran, who had called me from England to help aid uh, his writing for a Mojo article, and I was very open about it. I told him I was writing my own memoirs and had a vision of writing a screenplay, and I said, but my eggs are your eggs. I, it, I don't find it threatening, and I think it's a synergistic bag that we all come together. It was then he told me about Bruce's passing in 83. He confirmed Bruce's passing. I kind of heard something on the street. I had heard, I had run into Bianchi on the street that Bruce was playing at Covent Gardens as the house pianist. I uh, didn't want to go in because I was burned and I had no loyalty. As I said, I threw his scores out. Anything connected with him, I threw in the trash. Flush. <laughs> next. And then I went out and the next thing I became Nell Carter's music director and playing at the grand finale and, well, you know, just hustle, 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 hustle. And that's what was happening. The reaction of the community was hateful, loathing, spiteful, almost portraying him as a degenerate, and an embarrassment to his brethren of the community. One has to assume he had his own ego agenda, was aware of his abilities. You have to remember, he would stun me in the process of the insanity of what I first had to learn, and then just sit down at the piano and do certain piano vocal things that I had never heard. And I would go, son of a bitch, where did that come from? And it was his work. I opened up all my doors. I sought them out and talked with them. And I said, Jerry, your exoneration's still coming. And I said, yes, you know, it's funny that he used the word to you. I'm the one who said, he says, I've always viewed you as rock and roll's Mike Todd. They might think you're full of shit, but you're somebody that you'll listen to for 24 hours and then decipher whether to discard or assimilate. And Jerry always had something. Look at his track record, for God's sakes. The percentages are still high. He, he, he is def, you know, he is dissed because of the Joe Bryant failure, but he had Carly Simon, he had Ashford and Simpsons, he had, he had the, uh, the Electric Circus. I mean, these were huge successes. So, you know, but I, I can see a man in his 70s would like to be exonerated. I can see that. Um, and as far as my relationship with Jerry, I, I've buried my hatchet. I, I look at him on a different plane. You know, it, it, it's, I, I handle it in, in a business context. I mean, it, it, how many people are in our families that are dysfunctional that you say, I give, you know, you mess, you mess up once in business, I never do business with you again. 
you know, a family member, it might be three times, five times. You know, you go there like, oh, Jesus, are they doing it again? You kind of tolerate it. Well, I've, I, I've morphed, I use that word so many times, you know, I, I, I've evolved to a place where I have a bigger picture and I'm more tolerant and I can see Jerry. And, and compassionately, I, you know, I think Jerry is due his due. I don't think it was a buffoonery. Yeah, his zeal might have backfired on him that he really stoked the furnaces too hot and, the, and, you know, and they tweaked, they, they, they weeshed. But I should only have somebody with that much belief in me to put money in line. I wouldn't be self-destructive at this age. I would say like, well, you know what? Let's pull back. Let's have a contingency fund. Let's do this and let's micromanage it. As opposed to, wow, limousines, drugs, rock and roll, baby, go out and buy all that crap. Well, all the, all the smart bands who survive today are those who micromanage. And that's why rock and roll is dead, because it's not innocent anymore. People pick up a guitar to make a million dollars, not to get laid. That's a fundamental difference. That's why rock and roll is a historical reference. I adore rock and roll, but it's a historical reference. It is a hip-hop world now. And we are so monosyllabically becoming monochromatic, going into a grunt, that I see the potential of tremendous renaissance happening, of going, a rediscovery of long form. A re I look at my 14-year-old son. He, he goes from Green Day to Artie Shaw to Glenn Miller to the 60s to Bill Haley to the Kinks, he adores the Kinks, it, to the Pipers of 1890. It's, and you're going like, and, and it's not like I'm seating because if I get conceptual, it's going to be quiet here. It's not like I'm playing this stuff all the time. But these are the, uh, the, these great, this is the renaissance that's about to surface because of internet. We have more knowledge accessible to us at the moment. Thank God we have to make sure that that's sacrosanct. But we have more knowledge that we can even do it that's accessible for us to learn and make opinions. This is why Jobriath is going to come back in spades and be heroic, mythic, mythic. Because nobody should be treated this way when somebody demonstrates the level of talent that they have. He wasn't horrible to people. He may have scared people because of his own outing, but he didn't go and become a pedophile. He didn't go and flash himself in front, in front of a group of religious ladies. What did he do? Nothing. And that alone owes him the revisitation. His talent definitely deserves a revisitation. And it's not even a question of deserves, because whether we're stupid or indifferent enough to accept it or not, it's bona fide, it's documented, and it's there, and it's ready to be copied. And any band would do themselves a hell of a lot worse if they can't have the wherewithal to do their own writing to cover Bruce's material. And I see it as a wonderful resurgence of many entities. And I would love to see a resurgence of glam. This... Think about it, Rocky Horror Picture Show, the Blue Man Group, the Tubes, all these guys are, are mixing and matching from the same place of this extraordinary, it's really a concert, it's oratorial like, but there's more visual to it. And it's that type of thing where you take it out of the cabaret and out of the, the, the demand of the book, of the book musical, where you have the entertainment. And this is my flamboyance, and here we are. Isn't that great? Bowie did it. And there will always be those who are intuitive enough when others don't see it to know when to grab the moment. And I have his library. I was one of those people to recognize the moment. And I want to establish his estate rightfully, if for nothing else, to spill over money into a foundation that this type of cruelty never exists again. Not, say, for a specific musician, but the freedom to pursue as your inalienable right, the pursuit of happiness. Very powerful stuff if we're to stay human. Very easy to lose if we're going to become people. Because I'm angered by how he was treated. Forget the, 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 the I've said this ad nauseum, but the shocking cruelty to a human spirit. But the lying of not acknowledging talent with all this mediocre crap that's choking us and is so derivative. And now you find people talking about how something is produced as opposed to the composition. And everybody is outboard processed to sound like Madonna and Janet Jackson and the litany. Not to, be, to say negative about these gals, 
But they're all processed the same. To my hearing, when I, when I have refined my hearing in an orchestra to listen to specific intonations and how juxtaposition of, of the, the woodwind section against the brass, against the strings, and how cohesive they play as an entity, playing my theoretical, my hypotheses, a piece of paper, to make a statement, a hundred musicians, I hear these things. And also I said, they're talking about production. Where's the tune? Where's the content? Where's the immediacy of expression? I think... Oh, God, I'm going to get political now. I used to say, I don't want to sound conspiratorial, but I'm absolutely convinced, and let's talk about just within this country, it was a conspiracy, the destruction of critical thinking. It is accountant-driven. I was very blessed to be born of a time that not only the transistor was invested in my lifetime. In fact, can you imagine the transistor was invented in my lifetime? They find the helix of DNA, perfect computers, and suss out DNA that we're all Africans, 50% of us are the same DNA of makeup of a banana, and you know we all have enough of those people in our lives to be considered to be the gospel. Be that as it may, and the differential between people is so infinitesimal, it's more environmental than it is genetic. So it's all nonsense. We are the human race. Finally acknowledge that, people, for God's sakes, before we exterminate ourselves. And the time is within this reality is what truly becomes important. It's not sitting in, you know, on television watching some talking head twirling your thumb up your ass wearing Chinese leisure clothes eating fast food. You have to find what is accountable in life. Boredom is the cancer. How do you not be bored? You invest in yourself. You investigate. We have internet for people to go on and assimilate all possibilities of what's out there. And Bruce represents one of these components, one of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of components of bona fide hypotheses, possibility of contemplation. What do you think of this? Is this audacious? Am I, am I being bogey enough for you? Am I scaring you, booga, booga, booga? Or am I really being profound behind all the humor and the self-effacing lyrics that I've written? And look at the construction of my music, whether it's borderline, minimal, hard-ass, inar inarticulate rock and roll, or he does Yukubian, or he does heartbeat, or he does inside, or he evolves to his symphonic Dietrich Fondike and all the other symphonic intermezzos that he had for his Paris show. This is bona fide work, even though it might be a, in a comparison in a limited portfolio compared to somebody who lives how many more decades, but it's a bona fide one, and that's what speaks to me. Bruce as a human being speaks to me as someone who demonstrated unequivocally, diary-like, that he had the soul to have these pieces that document that passion, that sincerity, that heart and soul that could only create this work. But he was such a complex, dysfunctioning human being that I can only accredit to the, the abuse of drugs, meaning alcohol primarily, but drugs as well, and then this, this stupid witch hunt of sexuality, and then the ultimate denial of his talent. There's 70 million of us in the baby boom who remember when he was, and there's still those who will discover him for the first time. There are talents now that you see that truly serious Joe Bryant wannabes. It's happening. As I told you, beautiful Ohio, closing music, world without end. Def Leppard already covered heartbeat. It's starting. Morrissey got involved with this, as the story goes, as I became aware of it. Apparently, Morrissey begins every single con concert, no matter where he is in the world, with Bruce's music. Mm -hmm. To give you an example, specifically, I heard that Morrissey was coming to Radio City Music Hall. I intentionally came early I sat in the house for an hour and change, and it was our music on a good sound system. And I've got to tell you, it held me. I said, damn, this is, this is the real deal. To make a long story short, Morrissey has a very specific agenda. I don't particularly know what it is other than Morrissey. It's like, I've got my little box. I'm going to buy Joe Bryant. I'm going to buy the New York Dolls. Oh, i got to perform. Instead of being a mensch and saying, you got to hear this guy, and being a champion and launching him, which would be brilliant for him because he could still preheat his concerts with his. His band wears Joe Bryas T-shirts. I've never gone after him for back royalties, which I should. I should clean his clock, but I figured, 
No, let them spread the word. He wouldn't even meet me backstage. He was more interested in meeting Nancy Sinatra. I said, do you realize that you're playing our music? I'm Jobriah. There was a pause. His manager talking, isn't it? Nothing. And then he sits some, he does one of his stage events, which was obviously so staged where he walks off and leaves people in the lurch because some, some one of the guards pulled off somebody from the stage when so many others were led up to go and try to kiss him. I mean, like, please. How much your time in Dixie? However, Morrissey, he goes and buys the symphonic stuff from Eddie Kramer, which he doesn't own, Eddie, that is. Jerry Brand owned them, so he bought those. I happen to have those masters. How Eddie decided, all power to Eddie, to sell them and make a coin, but Morrissey has them, and yet Morrissey doesn't distribute them or demonstrate them. I don't get it. The reality is that Bruce Wayne Campbell came out of a very strange home with various infidelities, various stepchildren, wounded parties all over the place who don't talk with each other, and somehow was a gifted child who resurrected himself and discovered his own sexual proclivity and demonstrated himself and lent it to such a point, found himself on the street selling himself, found himself playing wolf and hare, meeting Michael Butler, and all that, who I have, who's a friend of mine, and, 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 and this blossoming career and how Heather, you know, how Heather got involved singing, singing on his, his dates and other people from the hare group, and, and him slowly launching his career as a serious wannabe, of which I then help come and help, believing so, help perpetu perpetuate the image of Joe Bryath, as well as Jim and Steve and Greg, as, as part of our job and, and hopeful reward at the, at the end of all of that. I find it very amusing who comes out of the woodwork when. I know that what I witnessed in Bruce's life and in a great deal of his lyrics, what extraordinary pain he was going through. Uh, to hear stories of other family members who were in awe of him and, and this and that, and, and I don't want to disclose private things with, with Bruce's life that I've heard through hearsay. Whew. Well, if people are that capable of inflicting that kind of pain to a member of the family, God knows what they'll do when they smell money. What could have happened with the Paris Opera Show what rock and roll was capable of. You have to recall, 1974, you still had the stage production of Rocky Horror Picture Show. You had the tubes. Th this is, was the beginning, the foment, the beginning of really putting more and more visual, like the Kiss type of thing, Bowie getting more extravagant, the greater extravagances with his shows and the cherry pickers and this, giving people more bang for the buck, visual, visual. And also the beginning of video, though it was filmed then. It was the beginning of association, of a visual association with audio. We are now so saturated, I think it's safe to believe that people don't even know how to listen to something audio without a visual on it, even if it's just a static photograph. It's where, the way we're being indoctrinated, the way we're being programmed. The strangest thing about revisiting history, no matter how astute we ultimately pride ourselves, we can never go back. There are so many je ne sais quoi, so many insane things that we so take for granted, and just in the sheer firmament of things, that will never be there again. You say, well, I can put the uniform on, I can speak the speak, I can sing the songs, I can look at it. But you're not there. There's the innocence. There's the explorations. The things that unfold that happen in the privacy of a bathroom, in a bedroom, that all add up to the way we applicably announce ourselves in life, and life synergistically announces itself in total that we really can't go back to. All we can do is find these parcels and the wonderment of these parcels. How did this really come out like this? Look at the furor against this. Look at, you know, like Stravinsky, Rite of Spring, right? Diaghilev, he wrote it. The bassoon starts, Paris Opera House audience starts laughing at what the hell is that? And a riot ensues to such a point of disrespect that Igor storms out of the house. Then we have the First World War and people start revisiting the work and go, what was so wrong with that? 
And now we realize that Igor single-handedly, with a piece of Impressionism, though it is designated as a piece of contemporary music, single-handedly toward the 20th century from the 19th. An amazing masterpiece. Now, I'm not comparing Bruce, his life, on that seminal moment with Igor, but what's the difference? Bruce created a riot. A major riot. People are still rioting. They're so rioting, they're in denial. They don't want to talk about it. He must have done something. Who do you care who I sleep with? Other than by my human tendency to be a human being, to be a good person, somebody to emulate, and I happen to be gay, or I happen to be straight, or I happen to be an African-American, or I happen to be a Latino, that's all that happens to be of importance. The bottom is, what is the quality of your life? How do you live your life? What are you contributing to this planet that in such now dire need of contribution before we all are expunged because of cynicism, greed, and stupidity? Right? You know, and this is what gets me crazy. And what I'm looking at, and, and, and the, you know, and, and the own, my own frightful pursuits of keeping my family together and doing the best for my son to, to instill in him knowledge and as knowledge is power and options for him to be a functioning human being. And hopefully that I'm not so flawed that he can learn something from that to be a functioning, contributing, synergistic human being on this planet. That I look at Bruce as a contributor in spite of all the... the the pain and the fractured and, and all the outrageous insults that he afforded me because he was in such pain, I now, thank God, evolved enough to just recognize that he was a hurting puppy. But my God, look at his contribution. Not to war, not to racism, not to sexism, but to humor and to music and incredible. And certain pieces so, so soulfully heartfelt, you cannot deny it without proving yourself having a previous agenda and are in total denial to his gift. And that's what got me so huffed up and puffed and sitting on a, on a soapbox. When you accurately, why, why am I going after Joe Bryant? Especially somebody who, who sadistically treated me the way he did. I got over that. I'm a functioning, total, complete human being. I have fulfilled my, my vision of, of, of going after my vision quest. I ain't done until I'm done. And I intend to be here a long, bloody time. So I'm, I'm me. Yeah, I make mistakes. Yeah, shortcomings, there's trials and tribulations. That's called life. Sisyphus, right? Both ways. We're going up the hill constantly. As you get older, you try to level the playing field so you're as frictionless as possible. But that's my vision quest. And the glory of all that is I'm never bored. And what did Bruce do? With all the bullshit, and I could go editorial and be cynical and be nasty and tear him down, I would lie to you if I ever told you I was bored. And I was never bored in his presence. And I tip my hat to anybody who can do that to me. Glam rock, I still to this day say, never met its full potential. The dazzle of it. You know, you look at a, a wonderful show, Cirque du Soleil. Tell me Cirque du Soleil isn't glam rock. Really? What are they doing? They're juggling this and that, but the music's pushed in such a way in concert style? Or you say river dance, and they're dancing, and there's the orchestra on stage. Boom. Well, what's the difference, really? So this is a person spinning a story through vocals, and there's a band behind him, and here's his point of view, and he's demonstrating a stylized show, and his stylized show was going to be larger than anyone's, bigger than Bowie's, this Paris show, from what I ascertained, looking at the photographs of the set designs and all of this, and people popping up through the stage, and, you know, it might be kind of hokey now, I mean, certain gimmickry of certain little things, but the actual context of an entertainment coming out of rock and roll in a glam rock setting specific to the, the, to the artist was, in fact, in 1974, way ahead of its time. And if you don't believe it, go back and rerun the Midnight Special in its entirety and look at the commercials. And look how strangely alien these people are to our sensibilities now. As naive as they were and innocent, and they're talking about hair and flowers are popping up and this and that. And look how Gladys Knight talks about her. And I'm a deep, died in the world devotee to Gladys. What a talent. I adore Gladys. But she didn't even know what to make of it. And here's Richie and, you know, magnificent talent, Richie Havens. And he's in this kind of gospel of thing. You're going, 
that's Richie? It was one of some strange formulaic thing that he was developing for himself, and here he is juxtaposed to Joe Bryth. And you look at Joe Bryth coming out in this springy space garb, and I'm starting with the synthesis and the, and the, and, you know, and the harpsichord, and he comes out singing, I'm a man. And you go like, hello. <laughs> you know, we ain't in Kansas anymore, boys and girls. This is something different. And, you know, it's an entertainment, but, you know, you can get you know, wingback chairs with cordial and go, oh, well, yes, of course, and I remember that specific note and that abated, you know, nonsense. This was just fun, and it was more fleshed out, and it was theatrical. And my parents, showbiz people, recognized it as such and admired it as such. He said, good show. I mean, it wasn't about a homosexual. It wasn't about their son. It was, what's this? And the juxtaposition of everything else being shown on that episode. And you go, yeah, that was ahead of time. And you look at it now, 30 years later, and you go, well, what's the big deal? And it's still evocative. You go, what the hell? And what are they wearing? What the? And it's, right? Isn't that strange? Good for Bruce. Good, good for you, Bruce. I've always wanted a movie queen to call my very own That bright and shining star I've worshipped from afar Came down to earth to be with me tonight oh. I've always wanted a superstar to cherish as my own but so high in the sky I'd never dare to try To take the steps That I can take with you tonight With you at my side Ginger Rogers up and cried Busby Berkeley ate his heart out over you Betty Grable lost her charm And Florence Zigfield's follies looked like Brooklyn Zoo I've always wanted a movie queen To call my very own And here 